Hey there, welcome to That Dang Dad, my name is Phil, and tonight I want to talk about an interesting situation that I encountered and participated in when I was a police officer. As many of you know, I was a cop in Southeast Los Angeles for almost 10 years. Now I'm a police and prison abolitionist. You don't have to agree with police abolition or even know what that means. Just know that I am now a fierce critic of the behavior and culture of cops based on things I've seen and done on duty, as well as things that I've learned about the history of policing and prisons in the United States. A while back, I did a video on Rage Against the Machine, and many commenters on the video mentioned that they knew active duty cops and military as well as right-wing politicians who loved listening to Rage. People seemed flabbergasted that cops and chuds didn't understand that they were the machine being raged against. Well, I want to talk about that in detail, and to do so, I want to do you one better. Me and the guys that I worked with used to blast KRS-One's Sound of the Police from our cop cars on duty, especially rolling up on calls for service with the windows down. I knew guys who would play it through the loudspeakers when they went to go break up parties or hassle gangsters or whatever. How could cops gleefully blast anti-cop music from a cop car, you might be asking? I'm going to give you two answers to that. The first one will make you mad. The second one may teach you something about cop brain that you never knew before, and it just might make you even madder. Curious? I bet you are, you saucy little minx. Come, I have such terrible sights to show you. Anyway, let's start by talking about the song itself. Obviously, I can't play the whole thing for you because of copyright protection, so I'll link it in the description. But the main thing you need to know is that it has a really strong start. That's the sound of the police. That's the sound of the beast. It essentially functions like wrestling entrance music with that iconic beginning. So when you picture cops using it as a cell phone ringtone or blasting it from the car, for a lot of them, I don't think it's any deeper than that because they may have never actually listened to the lyrics. Lyrics that say things like, I know this for a fact, you don't like how I act, you claim I'm selling crack, but you be doing that. I'd rather say see ya because I would never be a be a officer, you wicked overseer. You hot shot, want to get props and be a savior? First show a little respect, change your behavior, change your attitude, change your plan. There could never really be justice on stolen land. Let me tell you from experience, if there's one thing cops hate, it's being told to show respect to members of the public. Especially people who are, you know. Police officers are trained to demand and expect respect from members of the public. And they withhold giving it until you've earned it from them. So right there, you'd think cops would hate this song. But then the lyrics get even more feisty. And yes, I know me reading out rap lyrics is like the height of cringe, but my hands are tied here. Anyway, he goes on to say, Yeah, officer from overseer. You need a little clarity? Check the similarity. The overseer rode around the plantation. The officer is off patrolling all the nation. The overseer could stop you what you're doing. The officer will pull you over just when he's pursuing. The overseer had the right to get ill, and if you fought back, the overseer had the right to kill. The officer has the right to arrest, and if you fight back, they put a hole in your chest. In a couple previous videos, I've touched on the origins of modern policing and how police departments evolved, directly or indirectly, from fugitive slave patrols. An entire genre of vagrancy laws were invented during and after the Civil War to criminalize newly freed black people and allow cops to put them in prison where they were, you guessed it, forced back into labor without their consent. So KRS-One is absolutely 100% not being hyperbolic when he links police officers to plantation overseers. There is a direct line there. And because of that, it's also apt to link the plantation overseer's exclusive monopoly on violence to a police officer's similar monopoly on violence. So for as fun as the whoop whoop beginning is, the track is very, very unapologetically anti-cop and in no uncertain terms. Why would a police officer tolerate the song, much less play it gleefully? Same with a cop playing Rage Against the Machine or NWA or Callous Dowboys. How can they listen to music made by people who loathe them? Like I said, I have two explanations. The first is as simple as it is infuriating. It's a display of total power. A cop blasting an anti-cop song with a smile on his face is showing you that your pouty little art projects have no effect on him. He is showing you that he isn't threatened by radical art. That it is so powerless to affect change, he can even enjoy it and dance along. I remember once on patrol we were hassling some gang members loitering at a park or whatever, and one of them said something to me like, You're just a fat pig who was too stupid to get a real job. So I smiled and I said, hey, stand up. He stood up, probably assuming I was about to arrest him or something. And then I said, okay, sit back down. He sat back down all confused. And I said, I may be a fat, stupid pig, but you still stand and sit when and where I tell you to. 
I'm not proud of this attitude, but it is the same mindset as with anti-cop music. Tell your little jokes all you want. You still obey me. I'm still above you. This idea reminds me a lot of what big brain academics would call recuperation. Ron Adams, translating Guy Debord, defines recuperation as the process by which politically radical ideas and images are diluted, twisted, co-opted, absorbed, diffused, incorporated, annexed, and commodified within media culture and bourgeois society, and thus become interpreted through a neutralized, innocuous, or more socially conventional perspective. However, the anarchists of the Ontario-based North Shore Collective put a little spin on this idea, and I think it's really apt. In a blog post opposing a prison expansion, they write, The state will try to undermine any anti-expansion organizing taking place, and the best way for them to do that is to take up a version of our demands and use them to justify expansion and reform. In a word, recuperation. Recuperation is when the state or another powerful body tries to involve its critics in a process of transforming the institutions they criticize. And this is a great segue into the second explanation I want to offer for why a cop like me would blast Sound of the Police. In fact, let's talk about a cop like me. Specifically, me. Back on patrol, I listened to all the lyrics. I even understood what they were referring to. I understood Sound of the Police as a biting criticism of police work, a career that I took a lot of pride in at the time. But even though I was susceptible to haughty demonstrations of power, that wasn't the headspace that I was in when I was listening to KRS-One. See, I would have told you, and quite sincerely, that I was not a racist cop. That I, in fact, hated racist cops. I would have told you that I was actually pretty reasonable and actually pretty cool, and thus I could listen to KRS-One critique the police because I agreed with him that cops who act like plantation overseers are bad. And I could agree with him because I wasn't one of those bad cops. I know. I know. Just settle down, we're getting there. As a white guy raised in upper middle class Orange County, my understanding of racism is that it was a personal failing mainly perpetrated by loser skinheads and hillbilly clan members. Racism was a bad thought that one guy would entertain about another person that could lead that guy to making a cruel or violent choice. And I was raised on Captain Planet, and Fresh Prince, and very special episodes of Saved by the Bell. So I knew that everyone was created equal, that no one should be mocked or hassled just for being different. I had dated black girls and Mexican girls. My ex-pastor dad was tight with his Hispanic outreach team. I used to swap shareware game CDs with the Dominican kid on my bus. Shout out to Wani, hope you're still gaming out there. In fact, I guess you could say, I was pretty colorblind. So when KRS-One or Rage Against the Machine were yelling about racist cops, racist government, fascism, injustice, I could nod and say, yeah, I'm totally with you with absolute sincerity and a totally clear conscience. Their critiques were valid. I didn't want to return to segregation and Jim Crow. I didn't support Westboro Baptist protesting funerals. I was a huge critic of LAPD's corrupt Rampart division at the time. I never once planted guns or drugs on anybody. And I saw American History X like five times. To put it simply, KRS-One and Rage Against the Machine were complaining about those guys over there, not me. Of course this is... incorrect. It wasn't until many years later that I understood what the machine meant in Rage Against the Machine. It wasn't until years later that I understood that KRS-One's linking of police to slave patrols wasn't just for thematic flavor. It took me a very long time to understand that racism, that fascism, that injustice wasn't merely something that individuals did to other individuals at specific dates and times, but rather interlocking systems that are self-perpetuating and all-encompassing. The area that I worked in was about 90% first and second generation immigrant, mainly from Mexico, but also Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. And while I could confidently say I don't arrest people just for being Mexican, it took me many years to see that the system, the machine, didn't need me to be personally bigoted to do the work of bigotry. When an immigrant can't get a driver's license and can't get a legal job, so they get paid under the table, get exploited by their boss, and we show up to keep the peace if they complain, it doesn't matter whether the responding officers like Mexicans or not because the cops will protect the exploiting boss over the exploited worker. When an immigrant is kept in a state of precarity through this labor exploitation and they can't make rent, the cops showing up to forcibly evict them are contributing to that exploitation whether or not they gave the blind side five stars on Letterboxd. 
And when some children of these precarious families grow up watching society exploit and abuse their parents and they act out in rebellious ways, cops enforce the curfew laws, the loitering laws, and the vagrancy laws that trap those kids in a carceral vortex that strips them of agency, strips them of legal protection, and opens them up to, you guessed it, labor exploitation inside prison and out of it. There's this phrase I've been obsessed with ever since I heard it a few weeks ago. It's a systems thinking heuristic coined by cybernetics researcher Stafford Beer, and it goes like this. The purpose of a system is what it does. What this means is that, according to Beer, whatever the designers and builders of a system claim to want, a system's purpose can be discovered by the actual effects that it has in the world, rather than effects it consistently fails to achieve. If a system constantly arrives at a certain outcome, that outcome is the purpose of the system. The outcome our police and prison system consistently achieves is one in which racialized, queer, and disabled members of the community are kept in a state of legal and economic precarity that enables capitalists to use them either as cheap labor or as a warning to other workers about what will happen to them if they stop cooperating. The police and prison system consistently fails to achieve safer, thriving communities, long-lasting behavioral interventions, or long-term economic stability in those who find themselves caught in it. The purpose of a system is what it does. The purpose of the police and prison system is to create exploitable labor, a docile public, and otherized scapegoats for that public to rally against. This is what KRS-One and Rage are talking about. And when you tell me that actually your brother, your aunt, your best friend is one of the good cops, this is the analysis that I am 99% certain that your brother, your aunt, or your best friend aren't grappling with. They are one of the good ones in a system whose purpose is to suppress and exploit. Well, so was I. It's bullshit. It's like looking at a gun that was used in a mass shooting and expecting me to care that the steel in the barrel was high quality. Who gives a fuck? So anyway, the next time you hear a cop's ringtone come in with that iconic whoop whoop, the next time you see Paul Ryan clanging iron to killing in the name of, it may be that they are showing off a little arrogant capitalist recuperation, or it may be even worse. They may be so vain they don't realize the song is about them. So, what's your reaction to all that? Which one of my explanations frustrated you more? And what does this mean for artistic critiques of power? Is there even any point if they're just going to get recuperated all to fuck? Let me know what you think in the comments. Anyway, thank you for indulging me with your presence tonight. I'm not trying to dine out too much on the whole ex-cop thing, but this topic has been on my mind for a while, and I thought you might find it interesting. If you did, a like would go down real, real smooth. And a subscription? From you? An honor and a privilege. And if you really wanted to blow my skirt up, you'd share this with friends and loved ones. But either way, I just appreciate you being here. I hope you're well, and I hope to see you on the next one. Have a good night.